Thank you all for coming out this morning for our monthly TRED talk. We have an exciting topic this morning, so glad you could all join us for us. A lot of you already know Ann Palmer, who is our speaker today, and has done a number of presentations for us over the last number of years. I think she's talking the Cord, the Corvette, uh, um, Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright, Wright and his automobiles. Hood ornaments. So she's just an amazing lady. Uh, Ann was originally from Pittsburgh, Kansas, if I remember correctly, and then moved to Topeka about 1966. Her and her husband Jerry, who's this fine gentleman here in the yellow, uh, come to a lot of our, our events. And Jerry's a mediator in Topeka. And uh, appreciate you coming today and joining us too, Jerry. But uh, anyway, Ann's been on our advisory board here, our collection advisory board, since pre-opening up the museum. That advisory board helps decide what loan cars we're going to get, what permanent collection cars we're going to get, some of our displays. I just run everything off of these guys. That's poor. And Brian Strauss up here is on that committee too. Uh, they get to listen to me monthly with my problems of trying to figure out something. So they're a wonderful team to have. But uh, anyway, Ann and Jerry have two children, and is it six grandchildren, I believe? And can I brag on it? Was one of them just? Oh yeah, you can. It's easier. Well, I'm just Otherwise, I. To Harvard. No, no, just graduated. Just graduated from Harvard. With yeah. her master's in education, and she has a job. <laughs> <laughs> we we, we told her she is now launched, and she got a. It's very hard to get a job in Boston area because apparently it's ranked as the best public school system in the country and she got one and she's teaching uh, world history psychology and honor psychology uh, in a high school near Boston nice. yes nice. yes well smartness runs in the, the Palmer family because Anna's no slacker herself she has two degrees from KU yes. one of them in 1964 bachelor's in secondary education and then a master's in 1966 in rhetoric and public address. Is that correct? Did I remember that correctly? Then she later wised up and came to K-State a little bit later in 1980 where she earned her master's in uh, landscape architecture in 1986. 86, 86, yeah. when she graduated. Started in 78. Started in 78. Yeah. That was a long haul. It was. <laughs> it was. But, uh, Anyway, I found out that I was in landscape architecture when she was going there too, or in architecture, I was in landscape, but uh, she doesn't remember me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we're so glad to have Ann here. Ann is just an amazing car aficionado. She loves cars, she loves photographing, especially hood ornaments and mascots. And um, she's a professional photographer. But anyway, I'm gonna quit talking. I'm gonna let Ann talk about the legendary Harley Earl. So let's give Ann a warm welcome. Thank you. I didn't know he was going to say this, but I have to tell you, I got this great deal because I heard they were opening, opening a car museum and I was hoping to sell some of my hood ornament photographs. And I talked to the woman then who was the director and it, it was a couple months before opening and she came over and looked at my photographs and was really delighted, but called me back and she said, you know, we, we really don't have something like that that we can do, but she said, there is a committee here that we need a 20s and 30s expert. And since that's where a lot of your hood ornaments are from, would you be interested? Oh, I mean, yes. So I came, I'll never forget, to the first meeting, and I think Doug was there then. And so at the end, they all, all of the, of the other four people just, and Doug thanked me so much for coming all the way from Topeka you know, for this. And I said, look, we've been here an hour and a half. The only thing we've talked about is cars. And nobody has looked over anybody else's shoulder to find somebody else to talk to. Because with my husband, his eyes glaze over at 30 seconds. <laughs> oh, this was such a treat. And I have loved every minute of it. It's, it's just been a dream. So, Harley Earl. Uh, I ran across Harley Earl, other than just a floating name, when um, I did my first talk uh, four years ago this summer on Corvettes and found out that he was indeed the father of the Corvette. And I just sort of checked that box for Harley, Harley Earl and went on. And so then 
I think it's been about a year ago because this got postponed and changed a few times. I thought, well, why don't, you know, why don't I check into Harley Earl and see what Elsie did? And I thought to myself, you know, there's probably not going to be a lot of material. You know, he's not that well known. Ah, uh, no, there was tons. And my major problem in getting ready for today is I could talk for a long, long time about Harley Earl the man and you would be fascinated. He is an unbelievable character. Or you can talk about his cars, which are stunning. And so what I've tried to do today is blend them best I can. Uh, stop me, and if you have questions about any uh, of this, can you hear me all right? I'm, I talk with my hands, so it's gonna be really hard for me to hold, <laughs> hold still. Um, but the very first thing that I want you to hear about Harley Earl was a statement that just stopped me in my tracks. You have to, I know um, some of us remember the 40s uh, and this, the word sharp, you have to go back to what sharp meant then. And this someone said, who knew him, in everything he did, everything he represented, and all that he envisioned, Harley Earl was always crisp, beautifully presentable and correct, eternally razor sharp, almost to the point that if you inadvertently brushed against him at a business meeting or a cocktail party, you might find yourself starting to bleed. And I think that kind of says it all about, about who he was and what he looked like. He was six foot five. Now today, you see six foot five people playing basketball. But in the teens and 20s, there weren't a lot of people that size. Um, in, addition to be very, in addition to being very handsome. So he uh, had to order all his clothes and his shoes made specially. And when he got to General Motors and had some money, he flew to London to buy all his clothes. He really liked clothes. And one last thing before we get to the body of this, he was very instrumental in the eight years it took to build, opening in the 50s, the GM Technology Center on 300 and some acres in Warren, Michigan. And his office, now this is in the mid 50s, not long before his retirement, his office, his desk was on a dais, kind of like a throne. And he had a bathroom, shower, and a full closet that he also filled with many suits, ties, shirts, whatever, uh, in addition to a private dining room. So he, he lived pretty well. Um, now let me, okay. Hmm. All right. I can. Okay. Light's not bright enough. I. Um, if any of you, if any of you are really interested in Harley Earl, the book, uh, it's a biography of Harley Earl and GM, and it's called Fins. I ordered it from a used bookstore for five dollars, and it seems perfect. Um, but the author looks at things from a different standpoint. And the example, and I'm going to read it to you to make sure I get it right. I always thought that cars were invented because people wanted to go faster. And they wanted to get places in a hurry. Uh, it never entered my mind, and maybe some of you will know this, never entered my mind there was another reason for the development of the automobile. The Industrial Revolution had accelerated the pace of American life. Increasingly mechanized manufacturing and a doubling of the population were driving a growing demand for goods that needed to get from point A to point B more quickly. And all along the supply chain, horses were holding up the process as coal and steam-powered trains and ships waited for them to trudge to the loading dock. 
It seemed that horses no longer fit into the modern landscape. Their slowness was not the only problem. America's cities were packed with more than three million horses. Nearly 200,000 in New York, 80,000 in Philadelphia, 12,000 in Detroit. That many 1,200 pound animals produced an epic amount of manure. The city of New York calculated that between three and four million pounds a day had to be removed from its streets and stables, along with 41 dead horses, 50, 15,000 per year, the city of Rochester, which would be a pretty small town then, estimated that its population of 15,000 live horses dropped enough road apples annually to make a 175 foot high mound of manure, which would cover an entire acre. So in addition to creating an ungodly stench and costing untold millions to clean up and cart away, the manure called, caused serious public health concerns. By one estimate, three billion flies hatched in urban horse droppings every day, at times resulting in veritable clouds of the pathogen-carrying insects. Between flies and wind-blown dung dust, there's a couple of words, horses were blamed for outbreaks of cholera, smallpox, yellow fever, typhoid, feeding a growing consensus that the beast should be banished from American cities. So that's what brought about cars. It's sort of, I just never entered my head, but once I read it, I thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Put the book down there. All right. Uh, you may recognize this from here. This, however, is the real one, uh, which while ours is a perfect copy, there's a slight difference in price. Um, the Benz motor wagon from Mannheim, Germany was the first horseless carriage um, and quite attractive. Um, in 1895, thinking I thought that Henry Ford was first, I was wrong. But in 1895, the Duryea motor wagon in Peoria, Illinois was brought out. In 1896, on March 6th, Charles King in Detroit came up with this, which truly kind of does look like a horseless carriage. Um, then finally, on June 4th, Henry Ford in Detroit did this. Ransom Olds, August 11th, 1896, Lansom Lansing, Michigan. I grew up in an Olds family. My parents had Oldsmobiles in uh, the 50s. And then, not until 1902, did Henry Leland bring out the first Cadillac. Now, <laughs> I ran across this, which is kind of interesting, as Jerry and I were driving down Anderson Avenue today, this gorgeous blue 1933 Studebaker, it belongs to somebody in Manhattan, really good looking, jazzed up, but real authentic looking uh, Studebaker, made me think of this. Um, I didn't know when Studebaker started, but apparently they started in 1852, and virtually all covered wagons that went west were made by Studebaker. So that gives him kind of a special place, I think. Now, we're going to, let's actually go back one, because we're going to stop there for a minute. Um, early in the early 1900s, a man named Billy Durant, who was very bright, but as you will see later, had some problems. Um, he had successfully had a carriage company uh, in Flint, Michigan, offered a range of models from cheap to luxurious, but he had an idea of putting together a car company. Now, prior to 
like 1910, and I did not know this until I read this book, that the car companies were assemblers. They weren't really manufacturing the whole car. They, they out, we'd call it outsourcing today, but they would buy the body or the chassis from here and something else from here, and it was very scattered. So Billy Durant um, took a chance. He raised $12 million, um, I'm not sure how, and he used it to buy independent automakers of the time, which is about 1910. Buick, Oswaldville, Oakland, and several others, plus he wanted to buy Ford Motor Company, and Henry Ford was willing to sell, but he wanted cash up front. And we'll just leave Henry Ford there. I'm, I don't even like to mention his name. He, he has such a, this book explains he was even worse than I thought. But um, he then, Billy Durant, started what became General Motors. And the idea of autonomous companies operating in one umbrella. Um, he did some very smart things. He, first of all, hired the Fishers from Fisher Body and made them part of this. Then he went out and hired a man named Alfred Sloan, who became the biggest name for many years with General Motors. He'd had a ball bearing company. And then he hired a man called Charles Kettering, who invented the electronic start, so you didn't have to crank cars to get them started, uh, and held a hundred or more patents, and was a scientist, and a very bright man. Hired him as vice president of research. Well, this all went along for a few years until, I guess it was about 1912. Um, Billy's problem, I'm sure there were others, was he was a gambler. And he gambled too much. And he, he had brilliant ideas, but he couldn't run an organization. So Mr. Sloan from the ball bearing company became president of General Motors. And his friend, Mr. Kettering, became vice president. Now, I thought, Sloan, Kettering, wait a minute. <laughs> yes, the same Sloan Kettering. After they retired from General Motors in the later 40s, they founded, bought what was a small hospital in New York and made it into the world famous Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, which still is one of the foremost centers in the country today, which is, I think, kind of interesting. Billy Durant, tried every business he could think of because he had lost everything in the crash. He tried bowling alleys, everything, and died broke in 1947. So he was very bright, and, but he, he got GM started, but that was it. Um, Alfred Sloan retained the presidency until, I think, into the, well into the 40s. And again, those of you who are close to my age um, remember that in the 50s, the engine that drove this country was General Motors. Um, there, I think his name was, wasn't it, Charlie Warren, I think was his name, who was Secretary of Defense. And in the Eisenhower administration, they said, if it's good enough for General Motors, it's good enough for the country. I mean, General Motors was a huge factor. <laughs> All right, this takes us to Harley. And Harley Earl's father had been a lumberjack in upstate New York. And he moved to Hollywood, I know. That's, that's a real pivot, as they say today. And um, he married a quite wealthy woman, uh, or he married a young woman from a quite wealthy family. And so he started a carriage business. And he made beautiful carriages. And his son, Harley, who was born, um, I think, 1883, joined him in the business. But 
in, as you have seen with these horseless carriages, both of them saw the handwriting on the wall and said, you know, horses are going out, carriages are going out, we got to move to cars. So this 1911 Mercer Roadster, which cost, again, 1911, cost $2,200. J.W., Harley's father, bought this car. And Harley was then probably early 20s. And this car was said to do 70 miles an hour in 1911. Well, he took the car out, treated it not maybe the way his father would have liked, but the speedometer stuck at 80. So they don't really don't know how fast he really went. Um, but from this point on, they were partners. Now you think, Cecil B. DeMille, are you kidding? Um, when I saw this, I was, I was impressed. This was one of Harley Earl's closest friends. He was a real Hollywood person. Uh, again, well-dressed at six foot five, um, designing fancy cars for people. Was pretty flashy in Hollywood. And he did um, work for a lot of people that Cecil B. DeMille knew. What he would do, Harley, they would buy a chassis. Ch is it chassis? Ch chassis. Chassis. That's what I thought. Um, I also have trouble with Chevy. I grew up saying Chevy. And people have told me for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, it's a Chevy. So if I say Chevy. Sorry. Um, he bought the chassis, chassis uh, from Pierce Arrow and then he built the cars. And this one, for example, has the, uh, Doug told me I could do this, yeah. These side lights are from Tiffany uh, in New York. And the wire wheels were from England. And um, this was for a man named E.L. Doheny Jr. and all I know about him was that it said he had an immense oil fortune. So this was one of the cars in Hollywood. Now many of you are my age and remember Fatty Arbuckle for a scandal that we'll not discuss but he had a lot of money and this was a car that he also built on a, a Piercero chassis. And I just think it's gorgeous, just beautiful example of why people thought he did such a good job. The car I could not find a picture of, he did one for Tom Mix, and it had a saddle built into the, I tried everywhere. <laughs> I could not find a picture of it, but we can just imagine it. Um, now, this is what got him noticed. Somebody, and I don't know which Hollywood person, wanted this car. And he, it's, it's a 1920 Cadillac Type 59C. Uh, he was not yet working for General Motors, but he was his father's company had been bought by a man named Don Lee, who became a foremost car designer in, in, in Hollywood. And Harley designed this. And soon after, Mr. Fisher from GM came to Hollywood and came to Don Lee's studios and saw this car and asked Harley to play golf with him. And Harley did and said, essentially, we need you in, in, at GM. So that's I sh in the wrong order, but that's Billy Durant, the first General Motors founder. This is Alfred Sloan and Charles Kettering. That is Harley at about the time he went to work in 1923 for General Motors. I think it's a cigar or a really thin cigar in his hand, 
but you can tell then just by the slouch and the clothes and whatever that he was kind of super cool. Um, this was his first big deal at General Motors. I need to keep watching my time. Um, I, had, I was not super familiar with the LaSalle. It was between the Buick and the Cadillac. And um, sales were not doing well. And so he designed this 1927 LaSalle. When he joined General Motors, up until that time, cars had been designed, if you want to call it that, by the engineers. And they were only interested in the mechanics and the cars were little more than boxes uh, around the mechanics. And so when Alfred Sloan, who supported, um, backed Harley Earl his whole career at General Motors, set him up in what they called the art and color division. Now, the engineers were not happy and they called them pretty boys and a beauty shop, and they took a lot of abuse. But Alfred Sloan backed Harley, and he hired um, designers, industrial designers, with degrees from Pratt in New York City and some other schools, and set them up in this arts and color unit, and they set to work. And this is a first example. Now, any that is another view of a LaSalle of that year. And this, and you are all car people, obviously, and you probably know about the Hispana Suiza. It was a Spanish company, but the cars were too expensive for Spaniards, so they said this was in the teens. Moved to Paris. Well, they moved to Paris, unfortunately, just before World War I. And so they gave up cars and made airplanes for World War I, then went back to cars after that. So it's a Spanish name for a French car. And Harley was pretty open about stealing ideas. And this 1925 Hispano, Hispano Suiza is what he used as a model for the LaSalle. And the LaSalle did beautifully. Um, this, yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard, I had never heard of the pregnant Buick, but he went to work there in 23, the engineers were still mad in 29, and so they needed a redo of the Buick, and he did it. Now I have to diverge here a minute. A couple of interesting things about Harley, well there are many interesting things about Harley Earl, but one of them is he couldn't draw. Are you kidding me? A designer that can't draw? In retrospect, people believe he was dyslexic, which may be why he had trouble drawing. But he invented the clay model. And he could model quite well with his hands. Uh, and he introduced the first idea of clay modeling into General Motors. So he also had this retinue of designers all male, of course, uh, because he felt they couldn't afford, they were, they were on the edge enough as designers, they couldn't afford to take another edge of having women. So they were all male designers. And they would work with him and he would look at a model or a drawing and say, okay, I want that, those fenders lowered three quarters of an inch uh, or other level of detail. And so he, he had okayed the drawings, and at that time, he didn't have full control. So it went to the engineers, and I swear I can't see it, but it's this area right here that bulged. And the minute it came out, people started calling it the pregnant Buick, and sales were down 40%. And they said that Harley Earl was suicidally angry. He was just furious, and to the rest of his life, he believed that the engineers had done that and changed the drawings just to be mean to him. So Mr. Sloan, at that time, gave him full right, nothing 
could be changed after it came out of his design studio. And just an aside, I was telling Doug earlier, people say he was hell to work for, and I don't doubt that. He would be there at dawn and be there till after dark and expected the same of his people. Um, but they were loyal to him. So he had his good points too, but um, one story was he walked into a studio late one night and one of, and I can remember this from, from getting my MLA at K-State, one of the designers was asleep under his board, drawing board, fired him. You can't, can't work and sleep at the same time. So uh, after that, nobody changed his was that Sloan or Earl who had that demeanor? Oh, um, Sloan. Uh, pardon me, Earl. Earl. Oh, yeah. No, Sloan was just kind of a pleasant corporate man. Uh, but um, they also said that, and that he had, he had malapropisms that were worthy of Yogi Berra. And that some words he just completely mispronounced always. Um, and, but people found that sort of endearing. And, uh, and I think it's one of those things when he was good, he was very, very good. And when he was bad, he was horrid. Um, but nobody ever questioned his abilities. Um, now, he saved the Pontiac in 1933. The Pontiac was not selling well at all. And the corporate heads wanted, you know, we're just not going to make it anymore. And he said, just give me a year. So he, he said one time that everything was secret in design until it went public. And then once it went public, it was anybody's. So he looked for something that would spice up the Pontiac. And he adored the Bentley's front grill. So that is the front grill of the 1933 Pontiac with the Bentley grill. And there it is, which I think is just one of the prettiest cars I've ever seen. Uh, 1933 Pontiac coupe with the Bentley grill. Sales were up 90% and they saved the Pontiac for at least well after Harley Earl's lifetime. Um, this, there are a handful of cars that he is really, really famous for, and this is one of them. A 1933 Fleetwood Cadillac. They built it for the Chicago World's Fair, and um, it had amazing things. Lots of his cars in the 30s had, um, you know, fancy windows that rolled up and all kinds of things that didn't come into cars until much later. Um, but a really, really handsome car. Now, my husband, when he saw this, said it looked like a gangster's car. And so many of the cars in the 30s looked like gangster cars. And there were a lot of gangsters in the 30s. So I don't know what the relationship is. But this is a 1936 Buick Century sedan. And I had looked at this picture numerous times and it wasn't until yesterday that I realized that the front door is regular, but the back door is a suicide door. You know, one that opened out yeah. instead of the other. And I, I don't know if it was common or uncommon to put two of them together like that, but um, I, I had not noticed it. Um, in 1936, the Buick, he felt, needed, again, a shot in the arm. And this one just looks fast sitting there and was um, a roadmaster. Now, he and Edsel Ford were exactly the same age, two months apart. And Edsel, be well, Harley Earl was the first designer ever hired at any car company in the world. By 
the mid-30s, which is, you know, just roughly about 15 years later, um, Edsel Ford was doing the design work for Ford and brought out the Lincoln Zephyr. Well, Harley was blown away and, and upset. Blown away because he thought it was the best thing he'd ever seen Ford do. And upset because it's like throwing the gauntlet down. I mean, if Edsel's doing this, I gotta do something better. Um, but um, the stories of what happened to, I had not known exactly what happened to Edsel Ford. Um, but he died young in his 40s of what I would guess were untreated ulcers which became stomach cancer. And um, I'll only give, give one example that at a board meeting not long after, um, Edsel's wife yelled at Henry that he had killed his son. And that says something about the whole relationship um, in the Ford family. But this was Harley's answer. And this was the first concept car. Um, and, and not, it was also Harley's first, obviously, but not his last. This was called the Y job, and I'm, I'm not sure why. And it was remarkable. The, the convertible top went, you know, the back flipped up and it went down, which it was a long time before that became ordinary. Um, and you see what he was, one of the things he was known and, and loved, which was chrome. He adored chrome. And his eye was so good, he wanted the chrome built on these, particularly as you get into the 50s cars, at a 64th of an inch, you know, rise and decline, I mean, an, an edge because that was the perfect way the sun would reflect off the chrome. To say he was detail-oriented is an understatement. But he drove this car as his personal car for 12 years till he did the next concept car. Uh, but it set the standard for the rest of the 30s and then of course m most of the 40s they did not make cars and really it was late 40s before you saw things from this car get put into practice. Now I think that's one of, it was a 60 special Cadillac, 1938. Um, it was one of the more medium priced Cadillacs and this brings me to another very interesting, I'd heard, I'd heard part of this story earlier but in the 30s and 40s, uh, a large Cadillac market were African Americans. And you think, what? Well, they, the ones that had money, could not buy houses in good neighborhoods because of all the Jim Crow laws. But they could buy cars. And their car of choice, if they could afford it, was a Cadillac. And so the Cadillac sales had dipped in the 30s and somebody came to Harley and said, we had a real problem because a lot of, of, of they said, of course, Negro people want these cars, but the dealers are so racially biased, they won't sell them to them. So they have to get straw buyers and a white man takes the black man's money, buys the Cadillac. And Harley was outraged and said, this is ridiculous. And so that, that became a thing of the past and they started selling openly to, to African-Americans. And um, I thought that was a, a really interesting aside. Um, now, now, here's what he drove after he gave up the Y job. 1951 Buick LeSabre concept car. Um, here we see the beginnings of what he's known for, the fins. And I did not realize how much right after the war people were enamored of jet engines. 
And so lots of things had allusions to jet engines. Uh, and this is, this is his car and him driving it. And this is a better picture of the car without him driving it. Um, and it was, it was something. That's all I can say. I think it, it doesn't need any commentary. Now, the, the number 201 of 300 is right out here in this room. And that was the 53 Corvette. And if any of you were here when I talked about Corvettes four years ago, it's a great story. Uh, Harley Earl was determined to get into the sports car market. And he had seen young people driving MGs and other imports, and he thought, you know, we gotta get in this market. Well, as I said then, GM was about as well qualified as John Deere to get into sports cars. They didn't know what they were doing, but Harley was determined, but the technology was kind of behind. So they got this car out in 53. Ford had heard about it, and so they started work on what became the Thunderbird. And this car was underpowered with a V6 engine, fiberglass body. Um, it just didn't work very well. And they had trouble manufacturing them, and they didn't sell. They didn't even sell the whole 300 of them. And so the powers that be at GM said, you know, this is, you know, you spent a lot of money on this, but, you know, it's not going to go. And then they heard that... Ford was bringing the Thunderbird out in 55, so they got a reprieve. So it was the Thunderbird that saved the Corvette, which, of course, the Thunderbird petered out, unfortunately, and the Corvette has only blossomed. Um, now, <laughs> you want a concept car? I want to get my notes on this, because my memory, I want to be specific. Um, I had never, ever seen that. And it's from, what's, what's on there, uh, 1953. Um, okay. After the Second World War ended and GM started pumping resources into projects once again, they started um, a car that had been the idea of a race car driver. And it was conceived strictly as an engineering and styling concept. The Firebird XP21 was ready in 1953. It was designed by Harley Earl and he was also designing the Corvette at the same time. Made entirely out of fiberglass reinforced plastic, the bodywork, or rather the fuselage, was inspired by a Douglas F-4D Skyway fighter jet. Uh, it featured small delta wings, a tail fin decorated with the logo of GM's air transport section, and a bubble canopy that covered a single seat cockpit. Here's the part that I couldn't believe. The nose of the vehicle housed a 35-gallon fuel tank, and behind the cockpit was a groundbreaking power plant with an awesome name developed under the direction of so-and-so, um, and a two-part turbine engine that contained gas, a gasifier connected with a flexible shaft to a secondary power unit. In other words, it was a, just a jet, kind of, uh, with jet fuel in that fuselage. So I don't think they ever made more than one. Um, I think one race car was injured in it, and the main one died in another accident. So um, I don't think you hear much about it. But Harley, that has the... <laughs> certainly has the fins that uh, he liked. 
Now, I wonder, now maybe you all are familiar with this 1954, this was also a concept car, Bonneville Special, but I'm thinking, it's better looking than the Corvette. Why did they not go with this? Um, I'm gonna show you, there's, there's the back of it, and they're not gullwing doors, but they're a gullwing top. And I'm thinking, and I never could find out, they just mentioned it in the book, but what happened to it? I would have thought that this could have really, you know, I, I think it's pretty, pretty darn cool. Now, here's the 55 Bel Air hardtop. We have a 57 out here, and I don't know if it's this book or whatever, but some people are convinced that the 55 was the best, some people are convinced that the 57 was the best. But this did revolutionize car design. It was a real watershed in the mid-50s. Again, you have um, lots and lots of chrome, because um, he really, really liked chrome. Now, I wanted to spend a few minutes on this GM Technical Center um, in Warren, Michigan. Well, my notes are somewhere, but I know it. Um, 300 and some acres, a 22-acre man-made lake, uh, 25 low-slung buildings, and the design center buildings were made out of glazed brick in uh, crimson, royal purple, no, royal blue, chartreuse, um, uh, about six or seven, and they couldn't find anybody to make the bricks the way they wanted, so they built their own kiln on site and built all the glazed brick. Chartreuse was my favorite um, that they mentioned. Uh, but in the late 40s, early 50s, when the idea uh, that Mr. Sloan had of building a new headquarters for GM came up, Charles Kettering had one idea and Harley Earl had the other idea. And Harley's idea was he wanted to hire one of the most famous architects of the time. He was a Saarinen, but it was the father, like Elial Saarinen. And he wanted dramatic buildings and real change to, to exemplify the, the GM. And um, Mr. Kettering said that was a lot of foolishness and what was done there, the work that was done was the important thing. And he wanted a traditional building style. And he thought that to go into something like this was ridiculous. But Sloan went with Harley Earl. Took eight years to build. And this is part of the picture of, uh, from the, before it was built, uh, of the design studios here with the yellow roofs. And that is the design auditorium, which I have another picture of. Yeah, I mean, I, it makes me, I haven't told Jerry yet, but I wanna go to Warren, Michigan, and I wanna see if they, you know, what all those buildings look like today. Oh, forgot, the glazed bricks were done because, and Erno Saarinen, his son, finished the job. They were, they were Finnish architects. Um, but the reason they chose those colors and the glazed bricks, that had been done in the palaces of Abyssinian kings. I'll just let that be, <laughs> but that's something. So this was Harley Earl in his new office in that technology center along with, as I said, with his wonderful closet and private dining room and everything. And I would say he was a man in his 60s then. 
He retired at uh, maybe late 50s. He retired at 65 and died in 1969. Now, this is kind of interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. This is kind of interesting. Uh, in the mid-50s, he hired seven women, all of whom had college degrees in design, and I think six of the seven had degrees from Pratt in New York, a famous design school. And people were very upset at GM that they, some GM people were upset that he had been allowed to do this. They were never allowed to design a whole car, but they were hired to design the interiors, like they were interior architects. They designed um, the style of the seat covers or how the dashboard looked, or in one case, or several cases, they marketed certain cars completely to women and would have matching luggage in the trunk. Um, so it was still pretty, you know, sexually um, traditional roles for women. However, I don't know which one she is, but one of the women um, went on to stay at GM, became a division head, and retired after 40 years. Now, for the very last, this, this is real Harley Earl. And they, he was getting close to retirement. It was 1959. And he wanted to go out with a bang. And this, this was a bang. Um, you have the tail fins. You have the chrome. I remember this car vividly. I mean, not that exact car, but the 59 Cadillacs. And we just, oh my gosh, I think one person had one in Pittsburgh. And you know, you just, Oh my gosh, you'd drive by the house maybe so you could see it. Um, but um, it, it was something. And also at the end here, I want to mention our Harley Earl cars. We have a 57 Bel Air Chevrolet that's filled with classic Dagmars and chrome. Now, I'm not going to get into the definition of a Dagmar, but if you see the pointed uh, bullet-shaped things in the 50s cars, was named after a famous, shall we say, buxom uh, woman entertainer from, I don't think it was officially named, but that's what people called them. Um, then we have a 1955 Buick Riviera, beautiful car which was one of his. We have, as I said, number 201 of the 353 Corvettes. And probably the most beautiful thing that we have, and Doug has put a sign on it, and it's in a real prominent place, is the 41 Cadillac. And the 41 Cadillac, along with the 37 Cord, uh, are two of those cars that if any of us, if they'd let us, drove it around Manhattan, it would, they would stop traffic. They're both that good looking. So, questions? Once Earl retired, did GM hire somebody with his same concepts or something different? They hired Bill Mitchell, who was a protege of, of Harley's in terms of, of design, but the handwriting was on the wall. The era of the really flashy big cars um, was over, you know, they, they said the car, Motor Trans Car of the Year um, was the Corvair. <laughs> um, so times were changing, but yes, uh, similar, except that the first, one of the first things he did was fire all of the women, that they had no place in the design studios. But apparently one of them made it anyway. Um, his, Frank Hershey, was a protege of his who got hired away by Ford. And he was always sorry that he left. And uh, I think had he stayed, he probably would have been Harley's protege. But good question. Other questions? Is there anything in the book about say the 59 Cadillac simply being one upmanship 
over Chrysler when they introduced all of their... Yes, absolutely. They, they talked about that a lot. Um, you know, they're, they, they really tried, you know, one of the things that I think I may not have made uh, clear, one of the outstanding things that Harley Earl did for cars, prior to Harley, people, the idea of having a new car every couple of years as a person, or certainly having a different design of a car every year, was unheard of. And he was the one that came out with, you know, a new design a year, a new design a year. Um, so it became very competitive. And early days with, with Packard, and you saw with the Lincoln Zephyr, but um, later with Chrysler. And spying was rampant. And Harley insisted that all of the design studios be locked all the time. So the designers all worked in locked studios. Um, so yes, it had a real effect, real effect. I, I, you know, I can't, gossip would have been rife during the, the GM hey, you know, heydays um, in all the car studios. Anything else? By looking at the rear seats facing each other on that car, what are those humps? That's the parade boot covering the power top mechanism. That car has the fiberglass parade boot uh, on it. Ah, okay, okay. I see. The humps are covering the. Uh, I see. Oh, thank you, thank you. I I did not notice that. Just like I missed that suicide door until about the fourth time. Um, but anything else? It has been such a pleasure. I recognize many of you from other talks and how fortunate we are that this place exists and that we have such a good owner who is so generous uh, and such a good curator and CEO um, that allow us to do this delightful work. <laughs>